Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I'm, my name's Darren Morton. I'm the Director of the Lifestyle Medicine and Health Research Centre here at Avondale. And tonight we welcome everyone. Uh, this is actually a presentation that's part of a class, um, part of the, one of the units in the Lifestyle Medicine course here at Avondale. Uh, but we have some, some others that are tuning in as well, and you're very welcome. And so the lecturer for this unit is Dr. Paul Rankin. Uh, and uh, I'm going to hand it straight over to him to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Paul. Thanks very much, Darren. Um, I'm really excited to have um, Deborah Rhodes presenting as our speaker tonight. Um, I, when we started putting this course together um, a few years ago now, and working on putting the course together, I was really keen to find a textbook that introduced culture in a way that just not, not just looked at other cultures, but also looked at our own um, home culture and compared the two. And I went to a friend of mine, um, Greg Young, who was director of ADRA um, South Pacific, and said, I can't find a book. And he gave me um, Deborah Rhodes' book, um, this one here. And I read it through and I was really, really impressed. And so we actually made the textbook for the course. And then um, Mel contacted Deborah and asked her for permission to put some PDF up, which is now available to you, one of the chapter three of it. And Deborah, um, Mel found Deborah very, very friendly. And then I contacted Deborah and asked her if she'd present this session for us. So Deborah, it's really great to have um, you with us. And if you could just give us a brief bio of yourself and then we'll hand it all over to you. Thanks very much, Deborah. Right. Thank you very much to Darren and Paul and good evening, everybody. Um, before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land where I am, which is Wurundjeri country, and to pay respects to the elders, uh, past, present and emerging. And of course, on International Women's Day, I'd like to pay particular respect to the women um, who are fighting for justice and equality um, and recognition in Australia today. Um, so as Paul said, my name is Deborah. I live uh, about an hour outside Melbourne. Um, a short uh, summary of my background, I, I was born in England and migrated to Australia with my family when I was nine years old. So I'm one of the many migrants to Australia. Um, and I uh, lived in Adelaide, then lived in Tasmania before escaping to the mainland and going to university in Canberra in the 80s. Um, I was very lucky, I thought at the time, to win a graduate position with what was called ADAB, which then became uh, known as AusAid um, and is now, of course, part of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So I joined the organisation as a graduate recruit in 85. And it was a good time. It was a good, good, good organisation at the time. And I was very lucky to be able to experience some uh, work in the Pacific countries um, in, on various issues like fisheries and health and education, regional cooperation. And I had a posting to a place called Port Louis. Um, I can't really ask, I would in the classroom ask you if anybody knows where Port Louis is. Can, I can't see anybody putting up their hand. And nobody knows where Port Louis is. It's the capital of Mauritius. So Mauritius is on the, in the Indian Ocean to the west of Australia. Um, and I was responsible for the Australian aid program to Madagascar, Mauritius, Seychelles and Comoros at the time. Um, after that, I came back to Melbourne to work for Australian Volunteers International and ended up being the program director for um, the Pacific and Africa, placing Australian volunteers in many different roles across the region. I then had my two sons who are now 22 and 24. Um, and uh, when I came back after maternity leave, I went to work for what was then the consulting arm of Oxfam Australia, which was called International Development Support Services. It doesn't exist anymore, but um, I was also very lucky to be there at that time when it was a really thriving and exciting organisation. Um, and there, while I was there, I worked as the project director for a program in child protection in three Pacific countries, Fiji, Samoa and Vanuatu. Um, and then I left there 18 years ago and have been working independently ever since, um, mainly um, in, well, it's not mainly in anything. I sort of um, 
not dabble, but I work in lots of different areas. So I design international development programs. Um, some of you may have heard of Water for Women, which is one of the largest Australian aid programs in a long time. I was the design lead for that one. Um, I evaluate Australian aid programs. So recently I was involved in the evaluation of all health programs to the Pacific for the last decade. Um, so if you look up no, don't look it up. Actually, it was a terrible, <laughs> <laughs> terrible document. But anyway, um, uh, but I also do small and small evaluations. For example, I recently completed an evaluation of a, a drop in centre for people with mental health problems in Medang in Papua New Guinea. And this week, I'm about to start um, an evaluation of a nurse development program in Timor-Leste in, in Dili, in the main hospital there. So that's the design and the evaluation. I also do a fair bit of um, training. So I've held the role of trainer for AusAid officials for six years. Um, and then I held, held the role of trainer for Australian NGOs for about four years. And I've had various other training roles, including the Australian Federal Police. So um, I used to have the role to train all the Australian Federal Police who went overseas, mostly to the Pacific. And I would cover the same material that we're going to cover today, in, but I would have two days to do it. <laughs> and evaluation and training. My particular interests are understood in different cultures, the connection between cultural value differences and how change happens, uh, disability inclusion, and also um, the links between all of those things put together. So I was just saying to Paul that um, while the lockdown was on in Melbourne, I couldn't travel anywhere and of course can't travel anywhere now either. Um, and so I uh, decided to write two more books. So Paul mentioned one of them. Um, I've written another one called Capacity Across Cultures, which um, has got examples from Pacific Islanders about what works from their perspective. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> and I, the one I started writing during lockdown was called How to Facilitate Change Across Cultures. And then another friend asked me to write another one which was about using a strengths-based approach in international development. So hopefully there'll be published this year too. So that's, uh, sorry, it went on a bit longer than I should intended, but that's a short, a short version of my history. So what Paul's asked me to cover today is um, uh, some of the material that's included in chapter three of the book that he showed you before, the practitioner's handbook. And I think you've already received that chapter. So what I'm hoping to do today is actually just to bring it to life and to connect it more to you as people than just words on on the paper so that's that's my hope um, that we can do that today so um am i okay to shall i get started are there any comments or questions before we get started no okay so like keep going okay so um I've, I've prepared, I'll, I'll send you some slides later, but I didn't want to distract you from uh, too much. And I like to see smiling faces instead of, um, uh, you know, words on, words on the screen. But I will use the whiteboard in a minute or so. So I just thought I'd start by saying, well, why, why do I think that cultural values are important? And of course, you would all have your own opinion about why they're all important, but um, I'll share with share mine with you first, and then we'll do lots more participatory stuff as we go. So my view from working internationally now for 35 years is that cultural values are the most important influence on the way the world is at the moment. And you can say, yeah, but what about politics or what about religion or what about some other influence on the way the world is at the moment. My view is culture intersects with all of those things um, quite significantly. Um, so it has an influence on us as individuals. So it has a, a, an influence, our, our cultural values have an influence on our sense of identity, on our sense of our own self and our sense of purpose. Um, they also have an influence on how we think the world is and how, or how we view the world and how we think the world should be. So we have our own values that, 
that shape how we see the world. Um, our values have an influence on how we interact with each other. Uh, and not only ourselves, but also how organisations interact with each other. And I don't just mean family and friends, but people in authority, um, our teachers, our, our colleagues and, and people that we meet on the street. Our values um, have an influence on how comfortable we are with change. And I'll come to all of these specific things in a minute, but I'm just trying to sort of paint the picture about why I think values are so important across so many aspects of life. So I think cultural values are very important for organisations. And you can see in the newspaper every day that when an organisation gets their values wrong, um, things tend to go pretty pear-shaped. Um, we often are not aware of them until they go wrong. Um, so at an organisational and an institutional level. Of course, the values that exist in societies and in communities have a huge influence on, on every aspect of life uh, within communities and societies. They have a big influence on how entities, whether that be the local church group or the scouting group or an institution, maintain and sustain it themselves. So the values have a big influence on those aspects of life. And of course, values have a big influence on all of the systems that people create uh, to keep life going, to keep societies ticking along. So values influence government, they influence police, they influence ministers, they influence ab absolutely every aspect of, of social um, life. They also influence the distribution of power, and we'll come to that in a minute. Okay, so now I'm going to skip to the whiteboard, and I'm good to share your perspectives with me, because I can only see names and a few faces, so I'd like to hear from you um, about what you think culture is. So I'm going to go to a whiteboard and ask you if you can um, share in the chat box um what do you think of when i ask you what is culture what words come to your mind so if you can put some words in thank you sundaya sundaya i'm going to type them up as quickly as i can with a bit of a pattern in mind oops you're going faster than i can do it um okay Any more? World view? Yeah. Cool, you're doing really well here. Lots of ideas. Any more? Default perspective, yeah. Very good. Any more? If you open the local newspaper in your town and you see a heading that says culture, what, what kind of things might you see in there? Yes, very good. 
festivals. Yeah. Music, very good. Parades, excellent. So events and ceremonies, yeah. Very good. Yeah, entertainment. Okay, let's let's stop that now. I think we've we've got a good sense of all of the different aspects um, that could be included in uh, in culture. Of course, I think if I gave you another half an hour, you'd come up with a longer, longer list, but we've got the sense of it. Okay, I've um, very roughly put these into two columns. Um, so I'm calling the left-hand side column, the one that begins with food and on the right-hand side column, expectations about quality of life. I can't see that that's, I've got me over the top of it. So, oh yeah, it's there. Okay, so can anybody um, think about why I've got them in two columns? What's the difference between the things in the first column and the things in the second column? Well, the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Any ideas? I'm gonna look in the chat space for, so someone's written external and internal. Yep, outers and inners. Yeah, any other suggestions? Intrinsic and extrinsic. Yep, visible. See and can't see. Yep, how we show our culture. Very good. So in the textbooks, um, the distinction is between uh, objective culture, which is the 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 right hand, the left left hand side. I'm not very good at right, my right and my left. Um, so on the food side, the food, art, clothing, lifestyle, they're called the objective aspects of culture. So they're, they're things that you can actually sense. You can witness them. The things that you can see, as some of you have written, things that are visible, um, things that are outside the uh, outside of people. Um, and then on the right hand side are the aspects of culture that you can't usually see, they're usually hidden away. Um, so intangible, the things that you can't see, and they're called the subjective aspects of culture. Now, the reason I put language in the middle is because often that is a manifestation of the subjective aspects of culture, um, which you can hear and witness uh, when you hear people interacting with each other. So behavior, is or the way people interact with each other is often on the the left hand side the things that you can witness so when you go to uh, a culture that's different from your own you'll see people interacting with each with, with each other using language as their way of expressing values and beliefs so um, there are lots of different ways to communicate about culture, of course, because you could, we can talk about the things on the left hand side. So, for example, if somebody's coming from Solomon Islands to come to Australia, we can say to them, well, when you come to Australia, people will wear certain things, um, people will listen to different kinds of music. And when you go to a church, this will be the behavior that expected, this will be the kind of food that people eat. They're the things that you can easily see and witness or sense with your eyes or your ears um, or your taste buds. But the the topic that I want to touch on more is the is the items that are on the right hand side, and they're the things that people don't tend to see when they go to another culture, and often don't even think about their own cultural values, um, their own identity, often until they're questioned about it. Or, or under stress of some sort. So I'm going to delve a little bit more into to the right-hand side because in my experience, this is very, very relevant to how you interact with people of, from cultures that are different from your own. So I'm going to delete this picture now, this, this, um, this whiteboard chart and move to a different picture which will illustrate the connections between those various things that I've just talked about, the subjective and the objective aspects of culture. Now, a common picture that is used to explain this difference is uh, an iceberg picture, but um, there don't tend to be many icebergs in the Pacific. So when I'm using this, uh, when I'm trying to explain this idea in the Pacific, I tend to use a uh, a symbol that's a little easier to understand for somebody who's never seen an iceberg, and that is an onion. So what I'm gonna draw now is uh, an onion, a very simple onion picture. 
And we all know that onions have layers and um, that uh, we, we, we all know what an onion looks like and that there's an outer part of the onion and there's an inside part of the onion. So I'm going to use this as my analogy to explain the difference between uh, values and behaviour and how they're connected to each other. So if we use this onion picture, we can think about the things that are on the outside as being um, the, the things that you can witness, the things that we saw on the um, left-hand side of the chart that we drew up before, the, when we had the two columns. So we'll summarise all of those things and call it behaviour. So what we're saying is when you see an onion, when you see a person or a society or an institution, you can look at it and you can see the outside of the onion, uh, but you don't necessarily know what the layers are underneath. So if we think of um, the outside as being like the thing that tells you whether the onion is a white onion or a red onion or a purple onion or a brown onion, um, you know, that's the things that you can actually see about the onion. The next layer down in this picture is um, what I would, what we tend to call in the literature, the norms or symbols that uh, represent a culture. So they are the rules about the way things work around here, which somebody from the outside would have trouble working out. They might see people behaving in a certain way and realize there's some sort of norms going on here, but may not know what the norms are or what they mean. So that's the next layer down that you can't really see when you see a, an onion or see the, the, net, the layer under the skin of the onion or what's going on in a culture that's different from your own. The next layer down in this one is um, values. And we'll, we'll come back to this one in a minute and unpack them in a quite a bit of detail. Oh, I must move that. Hmm, how do I move that across? Okay, then in the center, we've put identity. Now that's a relatively recent um, shift. I had values in the middle before. Um, how do I move that across? I don't know how to move that across. Anyway, values is the second ring out. Um, so we put identity in the middle because really that's the core, the core of people, the core of organisations is that sense of identity, uh, which is very closely connected to your sense of values. Now, the important thing about this picture is not that those layers exist, but how they interact with each other. So what I would be arguing here is that your identity and your values shape the norms and symbols that exist in a culture and those norms and symbols shape people's behavior or a society's behavior. And one of the most important things for you people involved in, in contributing to people's health and well-being is the connection between values and behavior. So a, a question I could ask you is when you're going in to bring about some improvement in people's health, are you trying to change people's behavior or are you trying to change their values? Anybody brave enough to answer that one? I'm not seeing. I think no. Uh, so Keep Matthew's saying down. values and behavior. Sorry, somebody saying something. Yep. Go ahead. I, yeah, okay. Um, I'm not sure if that's right, but I feel that uh, mm, not the values. I think we can't have that much influence to um, change the values, I guess, but probably the behavior. Mm. Maybe, a, or <laughs> not sure. I'm not sure even it's black and white. Yes, that's a very good answer. So, it's very hard, isn't it? Somebody else want to say something? Sorry, I can't see who's speaking, but please speak up. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's Linda. I think sometimes we try and change behavior without actually impressing um, upon the person about the value behind the behavior. Very good. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly the point that I'm making here. Well done. Yep. So because values are so strongly connected to behavior, mm. You, you can't really change behavior unless you engage with the values that are behind it. And, and Paul said behavior change doesn't stick unless you change the underlying values. But one of you said, how, 
comfortable are we to go into another culture and say, we're here to change your values? Mm. Um, we sort of stopped that when colonialism was abandoned um, quite a few decades ago, really. So we have to be very careful about what we're, what we're engaging with here because we can say we're trying to change, you know, health seeking behavior probably is something that you might talk about in your course. Um, but really people's yeah. behavior is connected to their values. And it really is not appropriate um, unless we have permission to be talking to people about changing their values, just as we probably wouldn't be very comfortable uh, with people coming from another culture to us and saying, we're here to change your values, unless that was done in a respectful, collaborative way and, and we gave permission for that to happen, we wouldn't be too comfortable with that. Any other comments or reactions to this very simple onion diagram? Um, Deborah, sorry, I just wanted to ask something. It's Linda again. Yep. So yep. Um, sometimes it's not necessarily about changing the values, but really identifying what the value is. So um, sometimes, I like I believe health, be health behaviours can be linked to slightly different values, and it's just about learning to um, value something in a different way. Yep. Um, so it's not necessarily changing the value, but for the person to identify what is it in their life that would make a difference to them in order to change that behavior. And I think different cultures would maybe that, that thing that make, would make a difference to them is different. Yes. But still, it's both... Um, identifying that value for that person um, will stimulate them more often to change the behavior. So it's not mm. necessarily about changing behaviors. It's linking the behavior to a value that they value or yes. that something that they value. Uh, Very like, good. Uh, Excellent. Yep. Spot on, Linda. Very good. Yes, absolutely. And, and really, um, the, the, one of the key takeaway messages from this was how do we understand our own values and others' values in order to be able to make that link between values and behaviour, to find if there's a way of supporting good, you know, good behaviour, with quotation marks around it, um, that is consistent with people's values. That's absolutely spot on. Any other comments or reactions to this? obviously oversimplified model. Yeah, actually, I think this is really very, very insightful. And it's interesting, the, um, we do, as, as health professionals, we tend to go after the behaviour. And I think there's, there's been a bit of an, an awakening. And it's interesting, I think it's happened not just in the health space, but in like through health coaching um, is, is one area which is, looks, tends to want to look beyond the behaviour to what are the values that drive this. But I think we've even seen the same thing in, in like in corporate spaces and in sales where, I mean, Simon Sinek, who, who wrote yes. that start yeah. with why. And, and that's that whole idea of, hey, you know, let's get to the heart of why people do what they do and what drives them and what motivates them and what are the values and, and, and that, that, um, that underpin that. And I actually wonder, you know, to the extent if, if we only go after behaviours and we're trying to encourage behaviours that are not aligned with the values that people have, we're actually setting them up for success, uh, for, for failure, aren't we? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, we are, and and our and and our own programs too. If we think that we're going to bring about change by changing behaviour without understanding and engaging with the values that exist in each context, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Okay, I'm going to move on just because I know we've got a short, a precious time here. So we're seven thirty now. So. What I'm going to do is just present in the shortest possible time a very simple model to introduce you uh, to differences in values. Because, of course, values, like the word culture, can have lots of different meanings um, and it can be understood in lots of different ways. So I'm just going to rub this all out um, and draw some lines this time instead of circles to illustrate a very simple way of thinking about how cultural values differ between cultures, how, how values differ between cultures. Now, this, this model has been around for um, 30 years 
no, for, 40 years now. Sorry, I've lost what, what year it is. Um, 1980, the, the, this research was first um, published by a guy called Gert Hofstetter. Some of you may already know his work. Um, it's, it's, it's been critiqued quite a lot. And the research that he did has been repeated in lots of different places. Um, and I'll, I'll give you the references when I send you out the slides. But I find it's a very useful and memorable way of getting your head around cultural value differences, which importantly does not um, bring negative value judgments about others' values. And it's a very useful tool for thinking about our own values and the values of other people that we work with. So I'm basically going to just give you four lines because as a as a trainer, I've learned that people don't remember more than four uh, very easily. But the research that that's come out more recently um, under something called the GLOBE study um, has eight uh, different categories, but I think they're just variations on a theme. So I'm going to just quickly explain them. They're in the chapter three for those of you who've read, that, read it already, but I'm going to make it um, a bit more engaging, hopefully. Um, so, it, so it brings the words on paper to life. So um, Hofstede found that you can describe cultures according to how they consider the gap between those who've got power and those who don't. So he said at one end of this line, if you can plot the cultures all along here, at one end of the line, cultures believe that there should be a small gap between those who've got power and those who don't have power. So if you were to draw an organizational chart in a low power distance culture, it would look like this. It would be a fairly, oops, stop it and then drew another line. It would be a fairly low flat uh, pyramid where the boss is at the top um, here, the boss is at the top there and the workers um, let's make the workers the X's, they are not far below the person who's in charge. And there'd be many examples of um, how you would see that, uh, it, of what that would look like in a culture that are listed in the, in the handbook. At the other end of the spectrum, um, at the other end of this line here, you would find cultures that have a high power distance. So they're cultures where there is expected to be a large gap between those who've got power and those who haven't got power. So an organizational chart would more, look more like this, where you've got some kind of um, leader at the top and there's a very big gap between the workers at the bottom. Um, so the leaders at the top there and the workers um, are all along the bottom here. I'll put a few more workers on this side as well. And um, in a culture like that, where there's a high power distance, you'll often find something like kings or uh, chiefs or um, uh, nobles or some kind of uh, hierarchical system where there's expected to be symbols of power at the top and the workers or the, the people without power um, expect the people at the top to have the capacity, the wisdom, the experience and the status, sometimes existential status, to make decisions on behalf of everybody else. Okay, so this is the fun part. Where would we put non-Indigenous Australia on this line? Acknowledging that, of course, there's great diversity within non-Indigenous Australia, but I'm mainly talking about the dominant values compared with the dominant values in other cultures that we know of. So would anybody, yeah, so Paul's saying low on power distance. Any other variations on that? Anyone else? So agree with Paul? Yeah. Any of the... To the low power distance. Yeah, on the low side, midpoint. Ah, so Joshua was saying midpoint to the high. So Joshua, can you tell us why you think Australia, non-Indigenous Australia, might be on the high side compared with other cultures in the world? Oh, I think I'm more struggling to separate the um, 
non-Indigenous and the fact that you have to kind of remove the Indigenous mm. point to be able to sort of say that low. Um, and I think there's a bit of a power difference between the sort of blue collar and white collar classes still. Mm. But think, when you think mm -hmm. of the other cultures in the world, which cultures would be uh, would be more egalitarian or more at the low power distance end than Australia? I'm talking about the non-Indigenous Australia. Yeah. So Maritz mentioned Norway. Yep. I was going to say Norway, Sweden, Canada. Yep. So if you think of the, the Scandinavian cultures, when the when Hofstede did his research and the Globe studies repeated that, um, they tend to say that the Nor the um, Scandinavian countries are at the lowest end, and Australia's not much after that. So Australia, Canada, New Zealand, according to the research, will be part way along that line there. So if you think of the line as being, you know, roughly 200 cultures, which is meaningless because the countries don't actually match cultures, but just um, the value of this is in the comparison rather than where you actually plot a country. So we're not saying Australia is there definitively, but we're saying it's more likely to be at the low power distance end compared with other culture, country cultures um, than at the high power distance end. So what about Solomon Islands? Have we got any Solomon Islands students on here today? Where might Solomon Islands be in terms of the power distance? You have chiefs, which implies there is a respect for people who hold positions of authority. Um, what other, uh, I'm not getting any comments, any comments coming in? Anyone from Solomon Islands want to put a mark on this spot on this? So Matthew saying most Pacific Islanders will be on the right side. So Taryn saying on the high power distance. Yep. So when I've asked Solomon Islanders to, are there any, is Taryn Solomon, are you Solomon Islanders, Taryn? I can't really see. <laughs> Anyway, when I've asked many Solomon Island, oh, Sri Lankan, sorry, Taryn, I should guess that from your surname. So there's somebody saying here, mostly to the right, halfway, mid, middle to the high. <laughs> okay, so when I've asked Solomon Islanders, uh, usually with a, to, I've given them a, white, a, a whiteboard marker and asked them to go up to the whiteboard, they've mainly put Solomon Islanders pretty high up here. Um, okay, so... Pamesia is from Solomon Island. So you're saying, Pamesia is saying mostly to the right. Yes. So we're agreeing with you there. And um, what about um, Fiji? I think there is a student from Fiji in the class. Is that right? Where would we put Fiji? You have chiefs in Fiji. And a lot of respect for people who are in authority, generally speaking. Yeah, I'm not getting any answers. So I'm going to tell you that when I give the pen to Fijians, they tend to put it up here as well. And when I give the pen to Papua New Guineans, further to the right, Howard saying, yep, okay, we'll put it further up that way. And then, and Taryn saying higher too, yep. Uh, when I go to Papua New Guinea, people put the pen mark up here too. Okay, I'm going to ask Taryn, what about uh, Sri Lanka? Where would Sri Lanka be? And Linda's from South Africa and South African culture very much to the right. Yep, okay. Um, Deborah, I'm yes. originally from Iran and I would say that it's pretty much uh, close to the high power distance. So Iran, yeah. pretty high up there, yep. But probably a bit mm, closer to the high. closer to the middle, yeah. Uh, closer yep. to the right side. Yep. And then Taryn is saying, thank you for that. Yeah, uh, Taryn is saying middle-ish, but closer to the right. Yeah. Yep. So Sri yep. Lanka up here too. Yep. 
Okay, so we've got the sense of this. Now, the value of this tool is, as I said, not to put a culture in a place, but to consider it in comparison with a different culture. So the most important thing about this is knowing where our own culture is relative to other cultures when we think about the concept of power. This is very, very important for all aspects of leadership, how decisions are made about new policies, maybe their health policies or education policies. Um, they're very relevant to how organizations operate, um, whether people are included in decision making within their workplaces, all those sorts of things. But we need to move on because we haven't got much time. So then now we're going to look at the second line. This one refers to individualism. and collectivism at the other end. Now, I'm sure this is much easier for you to work with. Where would we put, oh, hang on a minute, before we move on to that line, we need to mention, of course, Indigenous Australia on the power distance category. So in Indigenous Australia, from what we know in this group, the people who are here, um, would we think that Indigenous Australia is more uh, high power distance or low power distance? Is that historic or current? Uh, well, it, if you say current, wherever the result is, is current in, in your perspective. If you say historical, then it's historical. It's only, it only has meaning in terms of how you allocate it. It's, again, this is, remember, this is not facts. This is about comparison for understanding. So, so while somebody somebody saying low power distance. I've just noticed Tracy's talking about England due, being high due to the monarchy. I think, I think you're right about mentioning England because it does have a, um, a history which is still quite prevalent in day-to-day -day life. England, England would be certainly more high power distance than Australia, than Australia is now, but how far along that, it would be a matter of opinion for sure. So, all of you are saying Indigenous Australia, low power distance. Yeah, Mel saying high power distance because of the respect for elders and high in sense of respect for elders there. So some different perspectives there. And again, none of this is right or wrong. This is just our pers perspective um, based on understanding these different uh, ends of the spectrum. What I read tends to confirm that it's more likely to be on the higher end uh, because of the way uh, decisions are made and the respect for the elders, um, which, which several of you have mentioned. So probably mid to high on that end. But this is very important to be aware of um, about how people themselves define their own cultures, just as we see others vis-a-vis -vis our own. So um, just an important aspect of that. Okay. The data on individualism and collectivism is quite interesting. I can't remember whether I mentioned it in the book, but the evidence says that Australia is second most individualist country in the world after America. That may be a surprise to some of you when people talk about extremists. Um, Australia, according to most of the research, is quite extremely individualist in its in the dominant cultural values, particularly in the non-Indigenous Australia. Um, the cultures that, there's somebody wanting to say something? Yeah. How is America first? Um, the, that's what the data says on the research about uh, being focused on I and freedom of choice uh, as the dominant factor that influences how people make decisions. Yeah, Marit saying the self is very important. So individualism is, is the degree to which uh, people are brought up to think of themselves as number one versus uh, people who tend to make decisions on the basis of what's good for the group. Yes, so Harvard's, Harvard's mentioned the American attitudes to COVID masks. It's very individualistic, but fascinating that Australia is only second. I think there's actually a bit of a gap between um, the degree of individualism, but relative to America, we're, we're second. Okay, let's think about some of the cultures around Australia. Um, anybody been to Indonesia? Where would we put Indonesia on uh, individualism versus collectivism?
closer to collectivism. Yep, definitely. And and Terence, uh, Sri Lanka, where would you put Sri Lanka? I'd put it closer to collectivism as well. Yep. Quite and Western almost. I yep. felt. Yeah. And Louise is saying China is at the collectivist end. Absolutely. People make decisions on the basis of what's good for the group. However, that group is defined. Uh, what about um, Fiji? Any suggestions? Yep, at the collectivist end. Solomon Islands. I think we're getting the pattern here, aren't we? Uh, so Joshua's saying stepmother is Thai, very collectivist. So Thailand would be up here as well. And Taryn saying Fiji up here as well. Yep. Okay. And Solomon Islands would be up there as well. And Papua New Guinea up there as well. Okay. We're getting the picture, aren't we? Okay. That one's a fairly straightforward one. But I think the most striking thing from that one in my perspective is that Australia is extreme on the individualism on, on these measures. Okay. Let's look at the third one. The third one, uh, Hofstetter used language that we wouldn't use anymore. But what he really meant was task orientation and uh, relationship orientation. So where would we put Australia on this line where task orientation um, tells us that when people wake up in this culture, they're thinking, what are the, what is it I need to do today? What are the drivers for my day? Yeah, very good. Everybody's saying up here task. Whoops, wrong, wrong one. Yeah, Australia is pretty well up there in terms of task orientation. Okay, let's look at some of the countries around Australia. Where would the orientation be? Would they be task oriented or relationship oriented? So in a relationship oriented culture, the dominant driver is to maintain harmony within the group, however the group is defined. It may be your religious group, your village group, your community group, your language group, your island group, and Marit saying relationship. Solomon Islands, so Howard saying relationship. So could we just do the, what we've done in the one before? Lots of X's for all the countries around Australia, much more relationship oriented than task oriented. Maybe China might be more in the middle, um, very task oriented but also maintaining the relationship with the family. Matthew saying depends on what area, yep. When I tend to give the pens to the people who I work with in development programs around most countries around Australia, um, they tend to put an X at this end. Um, okay, I'm gonna to go to the fourth one. I'm really conscious of the time. Um, and I had some more material, which I won't have time to cover. But this last one is quite important for all of you because you're involved in change. And this one is to do with how change, how cultures see change. So they, um, uh, uh, Hofstetter found that some cultures are quite comfortable with change. And he called that low on uncertainty avoidance. And other cultures are quite uncomfortable with change. So they are high on uncertainty avoidance, which means that they would prefer things to stay the same. They would dom uh, give much more credit to um, uh, the status quo. Whereas at the low end, people are quite comfortable with change. They expect change. Uh, a lot of systems are based on promoting change and managing change and managing the risks of change. And the ultimate is if you are innovative. Um, and if any of you listen to a minister these days, you will hear them talk about innovation, um, which is the sign that they are low on uncertainty avoidance. Let's do a few X's on high, which cultures, oh, on the cultures around Australia and whether they might be high or low on uncertainty avoidance, comfortable with change or not. Any suggestions coming through on chat about where Solomon Islands might be? Okay, so Josh was saying US is high, not wanting to change that. Japan high, Marit saying medium to high for Solomon Islands. 
So up here. Okay, so I know we could keep going on this, but I'm conscious of the time. Basically, when I give pens to people in cultures around Australia, they tend to say that their culture is more comfortable with the status quo. And if there is going to be any change, they want it directed by somebody at the top in a high hierarchy, that the whole group agrees to it, and that there's no disharmony in the process of bringing about the change. And therefore, the changes are more likely to be incremental than transformative. Okay, that is the quickest ever discussion description you're going to get of cultural value differences, but hopefully because you've uh, read chapter three, um, that all makes sense. And I'd be interested to see when you look at that picture, I'm just going to draw a line to join the, the crosses roughly to give you a bit of a profile. So this is Australian profile here. And we'll, we'll draw the line of a one of the countries here, roughly. What does this tell us? What does this picture tell us? Any comments? You, I'm happy to hear from anybody who wants to say something because I'm, I'm gonna, I can turn this off in a minute. So Mel saying we are worlds apart. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And Deborah, that creates an enormous gap between Australia and our neighbours that we're trying to work with. Yes. Well said, Paul, absolutely. So for many of us, Matthew saying, do I offer this seminar to, <laughs> to governments? I, I try and I have in the past, but um, yes, I do try. I think it also creates a huge gap between different cultures within, within Australia as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yep. we, are a, we are a country that has a lot of immigrants from a lot of different cultures. And yeah, I think- absolutely. Yep. But our dominant values, the ones that drive our institutions and our leaders are not necessarily even central to be able to be close to the cultural values of the of people that come from countries around our region. So if, if I draw a little circle here, we can portray the gap between the values that dominate in Australia and the values that dominate um, in the cultures around us. And it's, it's quite a big gap. Now, some people would describe that in negative terms. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a, a, a big gaping hole or a big black hole or a big um, negative kind of thing. But for those of us who are working on bringing about change and contributing to a better world, we have to see this as an opportunity to make sure that our contribution is going to be culturally relevant, acknowledging that we have quite extreme values and we're mostly working in cultures where the values are not the same as ours and are quite um, at the other end of the extreme in many cases. So this space in the middle is, is where we're, we're all um, potentially going to work if we're working either in a multicultural Australian context or in cultures that are different from our own. So I'm gonna stop sharing that, but I'll, um, uh, so I can get to see your faces. That's much better. Okay, are you with me? I haven't lost anybody. Yeah. Are you finding this material? Are you up with me? Is it okay? Really interesting. Are you not? Really interesting. Yeah, oh, interesting. cool. Okay, a few, a few positive reactions. Excellent. Okay, so let's think about what does this mean for you for, for lifestyle medicine. So I prepared a few questions um, or a few points, <clears throat> and then I've got some questions for you. So what I think this means, um, if I've got four minutes, blimey. Um, what, what does this mean? I think it, what it means is that you need to be aware of your own cultural values because they drive you and drive the decisions that you make in your work and in your interactions with each other. Um, and if you're going to be engaged in trying to work with people with different cultural values, you've got to know your own to be able to be um, a work effectively with people who have different ones. And you need to be comfortable with them enough to be able to ask people about their own cultural values and not 
squirm and say, you know, oh, that's really uncomfortable because they're the, the things that are really personal or private. What I found, oh, no, I can't go into that story. We haven't got time. Anyway, um, so there's benefit in being aware of your own cultural values. There's benefit in being aware of the cultural values that may dominate in your own culture, which you may have different ones, you know, like, so for example, I'm married to somebody of a different culture. He's of Indian background, um, born and brought up in uh, Malaysia. So I'm aware that his values are different from mine, um, but I need to know that the, the cultural values that Australia has, uh, have an influence on how people see me and how they see him. So, you know, I look Australian, as in white Australian, but I wasn't born here. And my husband's been here longer than I have, but he doesn't look, look you know, what, what people expect. So it's, it's, you've got to be aware of your own and how other people see you um, as part of the result. So when I go to work in Solomon Islands, for example, people have certain assumptions about what an Australian should look like or should behave like and what the values might be, which may need to be, um, which need to be understood, even if I don't hold those particular values because I've become more collectivist or um, higher power distance or whatever. Now, the, the other thing for me that's very important for you is um, how values influence how change happens. So that last line, which I skated across in a couple of minutes, is a really significant factor for you when you're involved in trying to bring about um, changes in people's um, health and changes in people's lifestyle and changes in people's well-being. Um, so you need to be aware of how culture influences those. So some suggestions. I've got four. Um, my suggestion is you, uh, oh, I've just said that already, seek to understand your own values and others' values, remembering that you can't ever really know. You just have to seek to develop uh, a deepening understanding of others' values. Um, you often don't even know your own until you, you know, well, you may not never, never know your own values deeply because, you know, you, you just live them and may not need to question them often but you need to try to deepen the understanding of your own values and other people's values um, keep thinking about the link between the values that exist in each cultural context that you work in and the change that's happened in the past and the change that's possible in the future um, my other suggestion my third suggestion is to think about the skills and qualities that you need to have to be able to build genuine trust and respect across cultures. Now, there's a whole other book that needs to be written about that. How do you build trust um, in cultures other than your own? There has been some really good work done um, about eight years ago called Building Trust in Diverse Teams, which I can encourage you to look at if you haven't seen it already. Really? Um, but you also need to think about, well, you know, if I want to respect other people, how do I earn the respect um, that we need to be able to cooperate to bring about change in another culture? The last thing I would suggest, and this is the topic of the book that's um, hopefully going to come out by the end of the year, is to consider the use of strengths-based approaches in your practice, because strengths-based approaches are culturally respectful, uh, as opposed to problem-based approaches, which tend to portray others as lacking something or having a problem or an absence or a, or a weakness or something that you're needing to fix. If you use strengths-based approaches, you'd be much more culturally respectful. And it's now 8.01 and I've got a minute over time. I'm very sorry, but I hope that that was helpful. <laughs> and yep. I would encourage you to think about what does this mean for your practice yourselves? Sorry, Paul. Deborah, thank you, so, thank you very much. That was incredible. I, I really, really enjoyed that. Um, and it, it's different things. I mean, I learned very early on working in Papua New Guinea that a majority, a 51% consensus or 51% decision on the committee doesn't hold weight. You've got to keep working on it until you have a consensus in that country. Um, yeah. It's so, so yeah, trying to cross those and work out how what works in these different places is very challenging. But also very exciting. And that's what makes oh, yeah. the world a rich and interesting place. Yeah. Yeah. So has anyone else got any other questions? 
Uh, yeah, I, I did, Deborah. Just in terms of, you know, I was, you know, born in Singapore, but I grew up in Australia. And this, I found this really, really interesting, just, you know, reflecting on values and norms. And I kind of reflected and was wondering, do you feel that people's values can change if they do immerse themselves enough in the values of the country they've moved to? That's an excellent question, Taryn, and I forgot to mention that actually. It's a really, really important part of um, cultural values understanding. Excellent. Um, of course, values change, um, and yes, they can change over time. Um, the research tends to show that they don't change very much at a society level very quickly unless there's a revolution. Um, and when we think about how cultures tend to be on that left-hand side of the chart, it tends to be that they've had some kind of revolution. But at an individual level, yes, they certainly can change. And there can be a great variety within, within a culture, of course, as well. In fact, I think even Hofstetter says that there can be as big a variety within a culture as there is between cultures. And I remember doing this workshop uh, in Indonesia once at the Australian Embassy, and some of the Indonesian people who were working at the Australian Embassy said, we go along that line from one end to the other every day of our working life. So they wake up in the morning on the right-hand side, you know, um, high power distance collectivist. They go to the Australian Embassy to work and they have to work at the other end in those other values. Then they come home at night. So there is that significant dynamism and absolutely we do um, pick up cultural values uh, as we're exposed to them. Um, there's a some work um, by an interesting guy called Homi Baba called Third Space uh, Thinking, which talks about cultures that exist between different cultures. And there's also some work about polyculturalism that I found quite interesting lately, um, which, which says that people pick up different, well, that cultures pick up uh, values from other cultures, of course, you know, we, through missionaries and, and invasions and, and colonialism, uh, but also as individuals, we do that as well. We, so we pick up bits of culture from different places. So those four lines were only intended to give a very, very basic um, like coat hanger outline, but there's so many different rich stories and, and elements of that you can attach to the coat hanger once you delve into the different aspects of it. Yeah. Deborah, does that moving from one end of the spectrum to the other at different times during the day, does that cause stress? 100% stress. Yeah. It's, it's terribly stressful to, to try and uh, succeed in a, in a context where the values are the opposite of your own. Absolutely stressful. In fact, it, it's the cause of so many stresses in the world when people are being forced to, or not forced to, but find themselves in cultures which where the values are different. And for some people, they're very comfortable with that. You know, um, some people thrive on it and some people will find it very, very difficult, but it's always gonna be stressful of some kind, sometimes yeah. positive yeah. stress and sometimes negative stress. Absolutely, yeah. And for me, it explains why we have wars, you know, when people have values that um, they're trying to impose on, on others or, or people are forced to, to operate in cultures that are different from their own. Very, very challenging. But some cultures are more comfortable with working in other cultures than others, of course, as well. Um, so there's, so cultures will vary on the degree to which they're comfortable with that uncertainty that goes with operating in another culture. Um, so it, 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 there's a, obviously great variation, but I would say there was in, there'd be inevitable stress. Mm. Certainly for the Indonesians working in the Australian Embassy, they were stressed all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Deborah, I just want to just to comment without opening up a complete new can of worms, but um, it is interesting that it seems like um, particularly our political rhetoric is one that is now trying to actually force specific culture on different people. Yep. Um, and where we probably would know the most about how to manage in different cultures, we actually seem to be driving our own culture into one where we're trying to get this uniform set up by forcing beliefs and values on people. Um, so it's really interesting that that's the way it seems like politically um, we are being driven, not only in this country, but in many countries across the world, particularly in the first world. 
um, yeah, mm. <laughs> just, I know that's a whole new can of worms, but it's it just is, yeah. to see how that is being driven media and politically wise when actually, and we know probably the best or the most we know about how that that doesn't work. Mm. I think there is a very strong connection between uh, cultural values and beliefs and the way political ideas uh, are formed and expressed. But of course, you know, within a culture, there are great, there are significantly diverse political ideas. Um, but, but the values that I just talked about there, those four basic ones, you can see how they would have an influence on what political parties would say are important ideas. So if, you, if you're in a culture that's very collectivist, then the politicians will say, you know, we've all got to stick together and be in this, uh, we've all got to have the same ideas. Whereas in an individualist culture, there'd be an expectation that people could have express their diverse views and there'd be more inclusive perspectives. So, so there is a connection between values and politics. Um, but yeah, there's a whole world of books and ideas about that which as you say it's a, a Pandora's box there yeah I just wanted to make a comment Deborah thank you very much um I just found your book very very interesting I, I thought the fact that you're not aware of your own values sometimes not until someone else points it out to you yep I think that's like that's a great opportunity for us yep. I feel that as an opportunity like because people ask we um Paul sent put up this video of a guy who lived in Norway for a few years and he talked about the Norwegian culture in a way that I'd never thought of. And, you know, my whole life, I've never thought, oh, yeah, I do only have two, three expressions, facial expressions that I show, you know, like, and no one else, you know, I, I just didn't, wasn't aware. So I think it actually it opens up um, for lifestyle medicine to be quite effective because people don't know their own values. Yes, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And it's so crucial if you're going to be engaged with other people and expecting their values to change that you know what yours are relative to theirs, you know, like yeah. it's otherwise, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> but I agree with you. Yeah, it's very important. Yeah. Interesting. And again, going back to what Taryn was saying, that doesn't mean that they're fixed. You know, you can become more of something or less of something as you as you learn, as you go through life, as you get older, as you have yeah. children, as you travel. There are many influences on that. I think just the fact that you're not aware because you live it. Yes. So yeah. um, it's just the fact that you can make people aware, it's, it's just such a, um, yeah, it's mind-blowing, it, actually. <laughs> yes. Yep. If we go back to that onion picture, I often say, um, you know, if you're if the core of you was like a cabbage, then the outside of you wouldn't look like, an onion, you know, because the core of you determines not not in a physical way, but in a you know metaphysical metaphysical way, you know, the the core of you determines so much of what's on the outside, but you don't see it because it's hidden away inside you as a person or inside the society, and it's only when it's tested or challenged or or um, when you're trying to engage in a change process that you, you need to you know surface that that core those core elements, yeah. It is worth saying, by the way, that, that these ideas are quite contested, you know. I mean, I've given you a simple framework to describe an incredibly complex set of ideas. And there's lots of people who say, oh, that's rubbish, you know, that, that idea is not very, it's not very robust. So, so please don't take it as a truth, you know. It's just, it's a model for helping us understand and, and for giving us language that's not too judgmental about ourselves or others to to open up conversations about how change happens and how you can contribute to it yeah. what would you say your biggest challenge have been in um some of the things you've done in your career like in with culture um it bring this is being change? recorded isn't it um <laughs> dealing with australian bureaucrats they're, they're the they're my biggest headache at the moment because they, they cannot see how extreme their cultural values are and they seem to think that they can just impose them all around. Um, I've been working today on two things and I just, I'm just shaking my head in horror that you know, this absolute um, ignorance that, that goes with, you know, yes, we'll go to the Pacific and we'll change their values about 
governance. It's like, what? Who do you think you are? You know, it's um, so that's my biggest headache, and it has been for about thirty-five years, really. Um, I, I, I mean, I think once I understood more about cultural values, and of course, I'm not saying um, I know it all by now, but I've started to understand it. Um, working with people from different cultural backgrounds is actually a total joy. Uh, I, I, I love working um, in all sorts of different cultural contexts, you know, within Australia and multicultural Australia and also in many different countries. So, but it's the bureaucrats who don't see how their values can be so um, single-minded that, that they're the ones who hurt my head. <laughs> Sorry. And that's, in I, interesting, that Deborah. <laughs> that's interesting because um, in my experience, we tend to char characterize the Americans as having that very extreme and trying to impose it. We don't think of Australians doing that. I think it's a very big revelation for lots of people. When, <laughs> when I do this workshop over a couple of days, I often have people on the second day have so they've had time to really think this through. We do a lot more, you know, engagement work. Often have people come to me in the morning just saying, "You've, you know, this has completely changed my sense of where I fit in the world and how I see the rest of the world." I mean, it's it's significant light bulb moments for some people um, about themselves and their place in the world. It's just it's a bit hard to do in an hour, but that's all right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's okay. So I wish you all the best for your for your studies and I hope that you will make a wonderful culturally appropriate contribution wherever you might end up working. Um, and thank you to Paul and, and Mel for the opportunity to, to meet you and Darren too. Um, I hope it all, the rest of the course goes well. Thanks so much, Deborah. I actually, I found this fascinating discussion. It, it's, um, it's really drawn to light for me. I remember there's, there's a, one character that keeps coming to mind who I, I, I consider to be very culturally aware and, and, he's, and he's quite well traveled. And I remember him making a comment once, one time to me, he said, I, I just love going and learning from the other. And, um, and I always thought to myself, you know, maybe that's the approach we need to be adopting. It's, it's not us coming in within our, with our, our preconceived ways of doing things and, and how they're the best, but actually going and, you know, being this almost appreciative inquiry, really, of, of you know, what, what can I learn from you? Um, but, yeah. But anyway, look, it's, it's, it's really, I think for us, it's just, it's, this, is, this is really um, relating to the deeper levels of, of why people do what they do. And, and in the, you know, the health industry where we're trying to help people to make better choices, perhaps with their health behaviours, which even is probably, there's a cultural bias there, isn't there? What yeah. is the better oh, yeah. choice? <laughs> But, um, but it's, um, it, it's, you know, we, we often forget, we just go straight to the superficial behaviours and we forget about these, these deeper elements. So, yeah, so thank you so much for your, for your contribution. It's been really fascinating listening to you tonight and obviously you've got a wealth of experience. So thank you so much for sharing it with us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And just for those who uh, might be, actually I'll stop recording right now.